you what, I, I've been a real bummer on this program for a good bit now, and that's easy for me to blame on anything at all that's related to Major League Baseball's labor agreement, lack of a salary cap, and all that other stuff. I'm going to try something a little bit different today. Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Pirates. And it comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins in the same place that you found this. The Pirates quite possibly have themselves a bargain and a really high quality bargain at that in Rowdy Telez. Why am I taking this long to finally start talking about Telez? Well, I, again, it's just the hope just gets beaten out of you with the way this entire setup exists. But enough of that. Seriously, just just for one day, for one day, I'm going to let it go. Telez is 28 years old. In 2022, he had 35 homers for the Brewers. 35. Also had 23 doubles, 89 RBIs, was a real force in the middle of their batting order. And I can tell you, as the guy who covers... Almost all of the Pirates' trips to Milwaukee for our website that he really became quite the figure up there. The the fans had this special kind of roar for him when he'd come to bat. And that includes, by the way, the first part of this latter season, 2023. He had 12 homers to start off. Then he got hurt. And he got hurt in a really weird way tore off part of his finger, and then just as he was coming back from that, he stuck the same finger into an outfield fence in Cincinnati and hurt it all over again. So even though he came back and played and tried to help out the Brewers, he only had one home run in the second half of the season. Now, why would the Brewers let this guy go if they thought he could get back to 35 homers? Only they can answer that. But the one thing that I'm seeing from afar in Milwaukee is that they're going through some things. Uh, They know they don't have Brandon Woodruff back for a year. They know, or at least they're pretty sure they know, that Corbin Burns isn't going to be around for much longer. Both sides, team and player, seem to have reached that conclusion. So who's going to stay? Who's going to go? It just doesn't feel like the Brewers are going to be able to hang on to the top spot in the Central. And as such, maybe they'll do a little bit of a reset as opposed to an overall rebuild. And to Les, he was going to have to get tendered through arbitration. And that was the end of that. So he goes onto the open market. And maybe this is the most unsettling part regarding to because he's out there. He's available for everybody. But the Pirates get him for one year and three million. Now, to Les, to his credit, when he met with Pittsburgh reporters to talk about the signing, whoa, boy, did he lay it on. I mean, he he sounded like he was working for our Chamber of Commerce, just describing everything in the most glowing possible terms in the, uh, the city, the skyline, the stadium, the quality of the team, some of the things that he saw that the Pirates did against the Brewers when he was on that side late last season. And good for him. But the fact is, when you're getting one year and three million dollars from the Pirates, you weren't all that sought after. So that's a red flag and a half. However, however, in looking at Telez's splits to prepare for this upbeat program, I noticed that in 2022, 31 of his 35 home runs came against right-handers. Now, most of his splits are not that dramatic. And of course, some of this split is going to be attributable principally to just having a lot more plate appearances against right-handers. But 31 out of 35, that's like Jack Suwinski-esque when it comes to splits for home runs. And I know everybody likes to solve every baseball problem with platoons, even though most managers, including notably here, Derek Shelton, don't like platoons. 
But if you were to go with something resembling a platoon, no matter what it is that you'd call it, and you have Connor Joe hitting over there. Joe did really well against lefties. Joe's a good glove. Maybe he'll get you a little bit of extra defense at first base. If you were to go with Jared Triolo, you could come up with some different looking production that in all would add to what you get out of an important offensive position while at the same time not reducing the manager's flexibility in the field. And what I mean by that is if either Joe or Triolo were to be the platoon partner with Telez, well, we know that Joe can play anywhere. And we've seen already that Triolo, in addition to being just an outstanding defensive third baseman, can, if you need him, bounce around to other infield spots. We've seen that. My guess is that Triolo, being a smart dude, and he is, is going to want to make himself as flexible as possible for a long big league career, whether it's in Pittsburgh or elsewhere, and you'll probably see him start expanding even to the outfield. I haven't heard that. I'm just suggesting it. So what if within all of that, that framework that I just put forth here, Telez were to be healthy and to hit the living snot out of the baseball the way he did in 2022 in Milwaukee. And by the way, he really did. It wasn't just the home runs and it wasn't just that American Family Field, which is what it's now called, is among the most hitter friendly in all of baseball, which it is. It's also that Telez has always been a very high ranking exit velocity guy. And this is where That metric that I know a lot of the older generation turns their nose up to. I don't care how hard he hit the ball. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Because if you just pop a few home runs out or it goes out into a friendly uh, atmosphere like Milwaukee's or altitude like Denver's, you're going to get fooled. You're going to get fooled a lot. When a dude is just mashing, when he is just ripping the ball, that tends to not go into slumps. If Telez is healthy, chances are very, very, very good you're going to see a real nice thumper somewhere at or near the middle of the lineup. And that's a good thing. See, I can do it. When we come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Your front door, your car, your bike, your computer, your gun. Safety is a habit. Every day you lock and secure your home and everything you want to keep safe. Gun safety and responsible storage are no different and the best way to help prevent accidents, misuse, and theft. If you have a firearm, own it, respect it, and secure it. Visit ProjectChildSafe.org. Brought to you by the National Shooting Sports Foundation and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Today's J1Q comes from Wayne, and it's in reference to yesterday's episode in which I got into a lot of facts, no opinions, just facts about how Major League Baseball's luxury tax system works and why it actually has very little, very, very little impact on teams like the Pirates. Wayne says, Dan, thank you for the interesting and informative talk about the luxury tax and salary cap. I thought the luxury tax would go to the teams that need it, but apparently that's not the case. Baseball's really got itself into a terrible situation, and fans of the Pirates and other teams are paying the price with bad baseball and no hope. I guess it's not going to change until 2027 in the new labor agreement. I don't think any Pirates fan expects this owner, Bob Nutting, to take money out of his pocket to raise the payroll. Actually, Wayne, they kind of do. But he shouldn't be stuffing his pockets with profits 
while the team is terrible. The only way anyone will ever know how much money Nutting's making is if he opens the books, which he should do, if he's not making the large profits that everyone thinks that he is, but since he won't open the books, the fans will just continue to think he only cares about profit. Wayne, I have a couple of responses to this, uh, both of which might surprise you from the sound of it. One is that the Pirates' books have been opened during Nutting's stewardship. They've been opened once by the owner himself in response to a, a major leak of several teams' finances and Nutting wanted to set the, the record straight. So he invited me and a handful of other reporters to PNC Park. We sat in this glass conference room and we went through a whole bunch of stuff, including an unlimited round of questioning. Guess what? There really wasn't a smoking gun. And there was nobody, even Nutting's most ardent critics or cynics or whatever you'd want to call them, didn't have much to say after it. Now, was it conclusive? Was it the way a CPA would dive into it? No, heck no. But there wasn't anything there where you went, aha! The same thing applied when I obtained a complete copy of the team's books. This was 15 years ago. Again, under nutting stewardship. And I still have it. There's no secrets for me in terms of how the stuff is tabulated, how it's put together, how much the pirates get out of this, how much they get out of that. The business model hasn't changed very much. And here again, there was no smoking gun. I wrote back then, meaning with the original obtaining of the book, I wrote again with that wider release. And I say it today. The pirates are cheap and they underspend where they should be, but it's only by about 10 or $15 million a year. Now, to your point, Wayne, when things aren't going well, should they still be keeping that money as a profit? You can argue that. That actually is an opinion. That's a stance. That's up to you to determine that. I'm a little uncomfortable with it, but especially when I feel like the team is getting somewhere closer to contention. But if you want a really, really good, accurate picture, like right now, end of 2023, right now, go look at Forbes.com and a set of books that were obtained just now regarding the Oakland Athletics who have lost money seven years in a row despite having a payroll significantly lower than the Pirates, and despite having a local TV deal that paid them significantly more than the Pirates. The individual who wrote this article for Forbes, Maury Brown, is a guy that I used to be really cool with him, and then we were arguing way too much back and forth about the salary cap and stuff like that. So Maury got kind of tired of my crap. <laughs> Maury was like, dude from Pittsburgh, I've had enough of you. But my point here is that Maury is very much anti-salary cap and being very, very doubtful that any teams are losing money. And Maury's the one who, in doing this research for this article completely supports the A's position that they've lost a ton of money, including just now in 2023. Go check it out. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Pirates, and we will do another one of these tomorrow. Tomorrow.